So, guys, I gotta ask. When you can get back to real life, where's the first place you're gonna go? Uh, that's a difficult one for me, because uh, I, I, I kind of... If I didn't have Twitter, I wouldn't know anything was, has been going on, because I just don't leave my house in general. But, um... I guess, uh... Depending on when this all comes together, I'm gonna... I'm gonna make a big old trip to Fantastic Fest and get back to being a big old cinema trash boy. I, I think for me, um, honestly, you know what I've been craving the most? I've had two weird cravings. One's a lot easier than the other. But one, I've been plagued with a, a craving for a double-double from In-N-Out Burger, but that involves a plane ticket and a lot of travel. Um, but recently, I had, uh, earlier this past year, I was working on a short film that's uh, going to be playing at a couple festivals now. And uh, for the recording process, we went uh, and used a studio at the Brooklyn Public Library. And I used to really enjoy uh, those days just hanging out there. Uh, I didn't think of it at the time. But now looking at it, uh, how much I, I miss being in that being in that place with all that life going on in there. I really would like to to get back there uh, when everything's up and run. Mr. Plane, catch a ride with us. We're talking 1946's The Best Years of Our Lives here on You're Missing Out with special guest Alec Gillis. Joining us today is a good friend of ours, uh, Alec Gillis. You might also know him as Vice Victus from Twitter. Uh, you know his work from Birth, Movies, Death, and now uh, for Luton Bus. He's uh, one of our favorite uh, critics on the internet, and we are so glad to have him here talking about uh, a very important uh, an emotional film, I think, for, for a lot of us. Uh, so we'll be talking with Alec today. Alec, uh, thank you for joining us. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure to have you, buddy. We're so excited for this. I have been wanting to do this for a while. Uh, so let's kick this off. Just to start, I'm going to read us what the National Film Registry said uh, about this film. Uh, they said, A moving and personal story directed by real-life veteran William Wyler, the film depicts the return to civilian life by three World War II servicemen portrayed by Dana Andrews, Frederick March, and Harold Russell. Adapted by Robert Sherwood from McKinley Cantor's novel Glory for Me, Greg Tolan's deep-focused cinematography is memorable for emotionally evocative long dolly shots. It also starred Myrna Loy, Teresa Wright, Kathy O'Donnell, and Virginia Mayo. The film won nine Oscars, including Best Picture, as well as two awards for Russell, who lost his hands in the war. So that's the National Film Registry's quick synopsis of why uh, they inducted it. And today we're going to get into why we think uh, this film has some value. Uh, now, Alec, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we let our guests uh, pick the film. But for this one, this is the one I knew I wanted to have you on for, because uh, just in our personal friendship, I have wanted uh, your thoughts on this film for years, ever since I first saw it. And I'm so glad uh, that you uh, agreed to come on and talk about this one with us. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I was thinking about how to start this off. Um, I guess maybe it's okay if I kind of give my background of the past where I've been for the past couple of years. Does that help? Please, by all means. Yeah, yes. it makes a lot of sense to us, man. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so the people who don't know, um, so I was in the Army for about uh, 12 years. I was an active duty uh, intelligence analyst. I spent most of my career overseas, uh, Korea, Germany. Uh, the two Iraq tours, a uh, year in Qatar. That was pretty cool. Then I did a... Um, I came back to the States finally at the Fort Drum, New York, substate New York. And from there, I deployed to Afghanistan for a, a year. And then I finally came back and um, I got out of the Army in 2016. And from there, that's when I, you know, I was born and raised in New York, so I came back home to New York uh, to live with my wife. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, it was a, well, it was a struggle to adjust, to say the least. But part of the part of what helped that was uh, aside from the support of my wife and my family, was uh, meeting these guys here actually, uh, both uh, you know, all Kyle and Mike and Tom, uh, well at our job at the draft house, um, and that was um, it, it was I was worried about it because I was a little afraid of if my I was afraid of how my interactions with civilians would be. But uh, it turns out, you know, just all the people there, um, all the people, my coworkers, were very understanding uh, of you know what I went through, and um, it, it really, it really helped my transition um, back into, back to the world. Uh, yeah. So, and from then, I've uh, since then, uh, from that job, I was, uh, I started school. I, I go to Ford University. Uh, I just got my bachelor's degree in communications and media studies. 
and now I'll be uh, when this fall comes, I'll be to start my master's degree in cybersecurity. So all things considered, um, you know, I have a pretty successful uh, transition, and uh, you know, and you know, thankfully, of course, I'm alive. Uh, I survived uh, my time in the service, and uh, fortunately for me, I don't have any severe signs of PTSD or any like a uh, debilitating injuries, um, like you see here in this movie. But you know, every, everyone's struggle, everyone's journey is different and it's fraught with their own its own perils. So, and I think that this movie kind of the way it has these three characters show that in their various walks of life. You know, the way it starts kind of in uh, they these three strangers who don't realize that they're from the same town, and you see how different their their lives are, but how they these common struggles they all go through in the film that reflects so many things that I've seen uh, both myself and my fellow veterans uh, in real life. Now, it should also be noted, and to give you credit, in addition to everything you just described, you also uh, are a film critic, a film writer, and you started doing that while you were overseas, correct? Oh, yeah. So that's kind of how I got into this game. When I was in Afghanistan, this was around 20, it was 2014. That's when I first started writing for the, the publication, Birth Movie's Death. Um, and it was specifically, it was, there was a TV show, a TV series called Enlisted. It was a comedy series on Fox. And I dealt with uh, this kind of a ragtag group of uh, reservists who uh, is a, uh, there's a uh, hard charging sergeant who comes to the reserve unit to whip me the shape, so to speak. So it's a little bit like, uh, uh, like kind of taps. Or, oh, sorry. I mean, um, well, it's all these kind of various tropes of army films and TV shows, but in a newer modern context of the global war on terror. and dealing with that, but in a family-friendly and humorous way, but also very heartfelt. So uh, after reviewing that series, you know, got great, great feedback from that, so I started writing uh, more regularly. And now from that, uh, over the years, I've kind of specialized in uh, war films uh, and international cinema. And my, one of my main missions, my main goals in writing is to expand on the idea of what a war film is. It's not just, you know, the, the guns and bombs and the blood and guts. It's what happens after the fact, what happens before the fact, what happens to the family members, what happens to the people whose countries we invade. You know, all, all there's so many facts about it, so many uh, factors involved with it that it goes beyond just the scope of the individual soldier. Well, and so, like I said, like, and this, this film is a good example of that, showing kind of all the, fam- the facets of how the civilian world is reacting to them being back in it. And and I just I have to note I mean truly uh, and I say this personally not just because we're friends but I I you are one of the best uh, writers out there when it comes to uh, reflecting on on war films and and how that uh, and and action cinema in general I mean I always know that if there's an if there's an action movie that that uh, that you can't get behind I know I'm not uh, I'm not giving it my time to even like get into like um you know we had we even before like, before Alamo we de- we weren't really like um me and Mike the most uh, well entrenched in the film Twitter or just that kind of even in New York's film uh, circles. Uh, but I always followed you. I always, I always saw your stuff on, um, at the time, Badass Digest then became Birth Movies Death. There was something uh, where me and uh, Mr. Gillis here met <laughs> before, we, before Alamo was even anywhere near coming to Brooklyn. You remember this, right, Alec? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a, the Dark Tower thing, is that what it was? Well, because they were filming Dark Tower in Manhattan, I went to take spy photos, and you, like, decided to, like, you were like, yeah, that's fucking great, and you, like, followed me on Twitter, and we just kind of became friendly. Yeah. And then, after the first John Carpenter show I went to see, you were like, yeah, I'm gonna be in the city, like, come, come through and just hang out, and I brought my ex-girlfriend at the time, and I brought Mike, and we just... It was a downpour, and we met Alec Gillis for the first time. And little did we know, only about a year or so later, we'd be working with the gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, what's that? Uh, serendipity, you know. <laughs> when we had the list here, I mean, it was simple. Like this is, it, we want to get people that can talk at length as like, uh, you know, an authority about something. I mean, there's nobody better I can think of, even if I wasn't friends with Alec Gillis. It, it, like, this is the movie that I think of this first season, he absolutely has to talk about. This movie, I've now watched it a couple times. 
And this movie is so full of, I'm glad I did my research after it. There is so much in here, some things that are just symbolic and other things that maybe have been lost to time a bit, that it makes it even more engaging. For those who don't know, Best Years of Our Lives follows three soldiers returning home from World War II. One is Dana Andrews who plays a character named Fred, who returns home to his wife, who he had just married right before they left, and discovers that perhaps the love that they shared is not as real as he thought it was while he was overseas. Uh, another is Frederick March, who, uh, you know, who's an older gentleman who works for a bank and discovers that it's a lot harder for people coming back from war to find jobs and find their place in the world than he thought. And the third is, of course, Harold Russell, who is a man who lost his hands and now has uh, two prosthetic hooks, and he's worried about how that will affect his relationship with his sweetheart. And one thing I think is interesting is early on when they meet, and they're all aboard the same plane heading home, uh, I have this note here, when Homer is lighting everyone's cigarettes, after the second one, he asks if either of the two men are superstitious. They say no, and he says that he is, and blows out the match and lights up a second one. Uh, and it says here, this is actually in reference to a habit amongst ground troops of the First World War. It is called the three-on-a-match superstition. The enemy would see the light as the first cigarette is lit, they would take aim when the second is lit, and they would pull the trigger when the third is lit. And I think that's interesting in part because that's such a... To us in modern day, that seems like such a niche thing to include in a film because you're thinking, who's going to get that? But in the wake of World War II with so many people who served, that does seem like that might be something that would be in the know then and has kind of just been lost to time. And I wanted to just start with that because also just a lot of oh no yeah. no well I mean also just at the time um, you said World War One right yes that was a World War One tradition originally yes I mean there'd be a lot of World War One vets still you know still kicking seeing movies and uh, that's definitely something they would pick up on and that their kids would be like what is is that something I don't get it um, I mean it's just one of those you know I'm sure we'll get into more of them but it's just one of those little things that makes the best movies the best just those little things that they won't explain that adds life and reality to the to to the story you're watching you know even if they don't outright explain it it just feels like Oh, uh, that's something that guys do. Guys that, that came home from war did. Well, it's interesting because uh that's an I guess it's an army tradition. Uh, you know and so the real act the real um my person on um, Russell, you know, he plays the character Homer Paris. So Harold was an army, army, uh, was a soldier in the army when he lost his hands. But in the film, he plays a uh, sailor. So you know, is, I guess you can say that that may not have been specifically a navy tradition, but the way he kind of, uh, I imagine he brought that into into the uh, character, and uh, and more important and more specifically is uh, the fact that these are these three men, they are from different services. Uh, so uh, Homer is in the navy. Fred is uh, he's in air force. Well, I don't remember exactly when the air force. Transition from to its own branch, I believe it was 1947. So I'm not sure if within the film's uh, lore, he was an Air Force specifically, but that he was, you know, a pilot or a bombardier specifically. Al was, uh, of course, a, a ground soldier in the infantry. So, so you have all these different branches uh, interacting. You, you might, you may see this in other movies. It's, it's always a fascinating uh, kind of dynamic when you get different branches together and see how they react to each other. Because for a lot of people, for a lot of uh, service members, they don't. They don't often see or meet or interact with other branches. So it's always a, a bit of a kind of a communal, like getting together, getting to know each other whenever they meet. Uh, like you know, I remember when I'm well in Iraq the second time, um, we had a um, a Marine kind of liaison who stayed with us for a few for a month or so. So just kind of getting the ins and outs of their their culture because you know they're all vastly different cultures. Um. So yeah, that that was part of what I found so effective in this film, especially when they first meet. Because like you know, in, that, in that same scene in the in the, uh, in the airplane, you know that was uh, Homer's first time, not just in airplane in a military vehicle, but in an airplane at all in his life. So you kind of see that 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 fascinating inter interaction between them. Well, it's also uh, something that's um, you know they they get into uh, at the end in the um, the iconic scene at the uh, the junkyard with all the planes that uh, the guy who's like trying to who's basically telling uh, Dane Andrews get the hell out of the plane. We're gonna wreck all these things. He, he's he's like, oh, you you fly boys thought you were so hot up there. I was I was down on the ground in a tank, really doing some real business. You you guys think you're all this shit, and you know it's just another one of the, like, it's it's another one of those world building things of just we've seen three guys from three different parts of the armed forces get together because of their shared experiences of being from the same place, but also coming home at the same time. Uh, but that you also get 
even in that brief moment that within the different ranks and you know uh, of the military you know there's go- there's going to be these weird almost uh rivalries uh not too dissimilar from uh like not like nowadays these weird rivalries between cops and firemen or you know i'm, I'm sure al could say it, it's a, this similar thing today of just how marines might look at the, the navy as like oh those pussies you know i think one thing too with that that because the movie really is about It doesn't show us the war, and I think it's important it doesn't show us the war because the movie is directed at it's it's half, you know, for the the soldiers and veterans coming back and and saying, like, here's some representation. But it also is reminding us that we weren't there, and it's asking us to judge these people and empathize with these people despite not seeing what they went through. And what I love about that is it sets it up from the beginning. The first time because the first two characters we meet, we meet Dana Andrews. And we're already told right from that Dana Andrews in a scene that in any other movie, in a in a uh, you know a more cliched film, Dana Andrews would walk up to the desk and go, "I'm heading back home from the war," and everybody would go bravo and clap for him. And instead, somebody cuts him off, like, "Yeah, great, whatever. We don't have a flight for you. Fucking go somewhere else." And then, when we meet Harold Russell, and I forgot about this, our introduction to Harold Russell is he's got his his hands in his pockets, and somebody comes along and asks a bunch of the soldiers there, "Hey, we got to move this plane part." And he just keeps his hands in his pockets, staring forward, refuses to get up, refuses help, doesn't say anything. And you can even see the the other guys picking up the plane part, kind of give him a bit of a glance. And we in the audience, if we don't know who that is, if we haven't seen the film before, are kind of sitting there going, oh, this lazy son of a bitch. Why won't he get up and, and help with the part? And it isn't until a couple moments later that he shows us his hands. And you kind of, as an audience member, are asked to sit back and already question the assumptions you made about him moments ago. So it's already from the beginning telling you in the audience, you don't know. And the same way with these, you know, the three of them, they're from different branches. They don't really know each other's stories. They just have to bond over what they can share. Yeah. And the, so you mentioned the scene you mentioned before with the, uh, the matches, you know, that scene itself is, it's kind of explicitly showing that, you know, you might think that, Oh, he's a helpless, helpless cripple or whatever, but then you see him doing you know, a very, Dexterous uh, activity, lighting matches. He does it, you know, do it twice on, on the camera without a break. Like he's showing that he's not, you know, he's not feeble. He's not uh, a sad sack. You know, he ha- he has ability. That's also that's what's very important uh, throughout the movie. That it's not so much that we feel sympathy for him because he's disabled. It's because his sadness and depression in his own mind of how he feels. When clearly, you know, as, as the movie goes on, people know that and recognize that. No, he, he, he is an independent man. He can do for himself. And it's, it's interesting. In fact, Harold Russell, here's one thing I found out. Harold Russell was actually more capable than even the character in the film because Harold Russell himself was able to undress alone. Like he was able to undress himself completely uh, with his hooks, but they added that element in for the character that he couldn't to add a sense of, you know, to speak to other veterans for whom that might not be possible. And the idea right. of that feeling of that great scene, this might be my favorite scene in the film, where he's there with the, the girlfriend and he's kind of just going, this is, this is what it's going to be. Let me walk you through how I undress every night. This is what you're going to have to do for me. Yeah, I like that. He had, yeah, within that, within that um, scene, he also adds that, uh, I'm lucky I have elbows. You know, other guys, they got much worse. Yeah. You know, that's a powerful statement, you know, to say that, like, you know, again, like, we are the, still in that scene, Garner, that's some sympathy for him. Of, you know, he's exposing his vulnerability of being disabled. But still, in his mind, all he can think of almost is not just that, but the other people who had it worse. You know, it's a very powerful thing to think about. Yeah, it's it's I, it's such a... I mean, and to take it back to earlier when we were talking about it, I hate to, to keep jumping around and everybody, but, um, you know, we talked about... I mean, this film is, is hugely influential <laughs> on, on a lot of people. Uh, I know that uh, Steven Spielberg is a big fan of it oh, yeah. uh, and, and watches it. What, how often do you say it was he every year? I right, think, Tom? Something I like that? think it's um, it's either once a year or uh, before he does a movie. So that could be two times a year with him. <laughs> and if you take a look at that, that play, that scene in the plane at the beginning, you know, I, I one thing I noticed is, you know, the plane is flying and we see out the window and it's obviously fake what they're flying over. But I, I think that works almost better because it gives it a bit of a haunting quality and it gives it whether it was intentional or not you get the feeling that because these guys are going home for the first time, the outside world isn't real. You know, that all they have that's real for them is the three of them in that plane. The outside isn't real yet. And you really 
feel in that moment with the three of them, Light and the Machinal, you do feel that scene later from Jaws in the boat. Oh, yeah. You do 100%. feel that that's where, where he's drawing from there. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, this is one of those things where you could absolutely see where Spielberg gets uh, a, lot of his, uh, a lot of his mojo from. And, and you could, yeah, definitely in Jaws, but you see it, I feel like, a lot more in this back half of his career where he's become a very historical based and less, uh, more, he's less about thrilling you. So like you could watch like the first movie that came to mind when I was thinking about this, that this is a three hour movie. That's just about characters. There's no scale or scope to this thing. It's just three hour movie about people dealing with life. Uh, I thought about Lincoln. He made a a movie that's almost three hours about, um, politicians just talking about the state of the world and how, they need to do something where you get ju- it's just that and you could even see it in stuff like munich or you know bridge of spies and the post is you know particularly and, and just that sense of like the good old like that he balances the reality of things without ever succumbing to nihilism you know it's very easy like i could honestly see a modern day movie of a version of this where um uh because i'm just bad with names the 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 with the hooks is Howard, correct? Oh, Homer, yeah. Harold Russell, Homer's character, yeah. Yeah, so Homer, I could feel like that character in like a movie made today, I could feel like, th- I feel like a movie today to like really just get you emotionally cheaply with that he couldn't, he couldn't stand living in life like this anymore and he like kills himself. That's what I think is so impressive about this film is that I was talking to, to actually Kyle about this before we recorded. I like this movie a lot and I like this movie a lot better than... Uh, all of the the Vietnam movies that kind of came out of the studio brats, like the your your Deer Hunter, your Platoon, and all that. And the reason I prefer this film is that I feel like any of the films of you know from the studio brats deal with Vietnam kind of lean really heavy into the idea of like telling you the audience, look at how society treats these men, and and we're supposed to be on the outside looking at society and condemning how they treat you know whether it's Tom Cruise or 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 uh, Robert De Niro or whoever. And what this film does so well is it makes every character, whether it's the veterans or not, somewhat empathetic and gives them agency so that instead of it telling us who we're supposed to root for or not to root for, it is speaking to us in the audience and saying, this is how we, including all of us, this is how we treat people coming back. You know, it, it's, it doesn't make a villain out of the son who immediately greets his dad with questions about Hiroshima. It doesn't make a villain out of uh, the the man, the man at the bank or the man at the soda shop. And the thing I like best is that um, Dana Andrews' character, Fred, uh, his wife, which is one of the, you know, one of the central conflicts of this film is the wife. Um, In the book that this is based on, he comes home and finds her cheating on him and divorces her. And it kind of gives us an easy villain. And what I like about this and, and the change that Weiler makes is that while you can draw an assumption from her actions that she maybe wasn't totally faithful while he was away, there's never an instigating moment. It's just that the two of them get home and discover, maybe we rushed into this, maybe we don't have the love we thought we did, and hey, I've actually fallen for this other woman. And it doesn't make her a real villain. It makes us question, well, what is life like for her while he's gone all this time? And what was life like for him while, while he was waiting for her? Like, what are these expectations they created for each other? It doesn't give us an easy out. Like you're saying, Tom, with, that, with the, the Harold Russell character, it doesn't give you an easy out. It doesn't give you uh, any narrative arc beyond this man having to deal with an extension of insecurity. Not even massive depression, but, but, but insecurity and, and, and having to find a way to live again. I, I think it, it doesn't ask easy questions and it doesn't hold our hands. Well, I also think um, what's kind of smart about this movie is that, yeah, it does give you the empathetic uh, sense that you, you, you know, you're with these guys, you understand why they're doing what you're doing, but it also does enough work with uh, the, the female characters to really show you how frustrating it could be to deal, you know, like you're tr- like some of them are trying, like um, Dana Andrews' family's trying and homer's girl is trying and they're just like not being they're just not being, like it's just fr- that there is the sense of frustration of like i'm trying to help you but you're not letting me help you and you know how um dana dana andrew's wife clearly is 
is un, it knows immediately he's an alcoholic now and he's trying to numb the pain that way. Um, I, you know, without saying, you know, without victim blaming or saying it's bad that these guys aren't helping, it's saying like we understand why they can't do it, but for these women that really like there is that there are more than I don't know how I'm trying to say like because it's not it's not saying they're wrong for being frustrated. It's saying like you it's understandable, but it's you know that they're also not getting mad at them and like saying like the only one that really even does that is uh um you know the the, the wife that leaves at the end. And what I think is interesting there, I'll say two things. One, I love the fact that Al, the the Frederick Mark March character, Al and his wife Millie, just have a good relationship. <laughs> There's no conflict. He comes back and, and she's there. And it's not that I need movies to shy away from that, but I do think it's important. And, and Alec, I hope you can speak to this a bit once I, once I finish this up. But like, I think it's important that not every single soldier's relationship in a movie needs to be depicted as totally fraught and terrible. It can be, you can make a movie where it is just, Two people coming. I mean, I love that the scene where they first see each other at the opposite ends of the hallway, which, uh, by the way, uh, Weiler based on his first time seeing his wife when he got back from. But I think it's I, I think that that's something great that, yes, we have Harold Russell being anxious about whether or not to be with his girl. And we have Dana Andrews with his argument with his wife and, and finding the new girl. But that with Frederick March, uh, with Alan Milley, that's that's a they're just there and they're together. They're supportive. And it kind of does this thing of it's not easy for these guys, even if they come home to a quote unquote stable and loving home, but there's still a lot of difficulties there. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I remember, you know, when I came back from Iraq the first time, this was, I was still single at the time. Um, so, you know, it, all the families and, you know, they have this big ceremony, uh, in the gym or whatever, whatever a large building that was available. You know, you, you see all the um, husbands and wives, you know, and boyfriends and girlfriends get back together. And, you know, it's just a very moving moment. And, um, and you know, and, and if your community is good, like mine was, you know, they, they have, uh, well, we have, we have what we call the FRG, the uh, Family Readiness Group. And I guess this is kind of, it's been a ongoing, evolving organization within the military that they realize that, you know, it's just as important for the families at home to have a stable community not just for themselves, but also for when the soldiers come home. So even though I was alone, that there was so so some uh, support in that. Then when I came back from Afghanistan, that's when I was married. Then you know I seen you know, the same setup in the same uh, big big gymnasium, big pomp and circumstance. You know, but you know my wife, you know, runs my arms. You know, so you know it's kind of you know the very uh, movie movie style thing. But it, they tell you in the briefings. Well, they tell both the service members and the families. It's not an immediate thing. Sometimes a lot of people, they'll, they might be alone for, they might purposely be distant or alone for a long time for the first, when they return. And part of what, so when you see the families, the different support structures that they have in the film, you see Homer's family, his, 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 you know, his, family, his uh, parents are a little older, and he has his little, I believe it's his, his little sister. Um, then you have, you know, um, uh, Al's, you know, full family. And then Freddie, yeah, his, his parents, and as he was with his wife, we have all these different different support structures. But they, in this film, they don't necessarily know how to support. And like you said, it's not their fault. It's that you know, this is you know, it's in it's a thing throughout history. But especially you know, you see it. It's only been recently, I think, that we kind of really grasp that there's all these nuances of how to how to help. So like in one scene later on in the film where. Uh, uh, Fred's wife, you know, just just snap out of it. Just snap out of it. Like, and, you know, she said this to him, and he's like, yeah, sure, I'll get on that. Like, she's, what she's saying is she thinks she's helping by telling him, you know, to get, your, get themselves together. And to be fair, I had a bit of that myself when I was, when I came back, you know, I had a, well, I didn't realize that at the time, but I had a pretty heavy depression for that first year when I came back. And my wife kind of, you know, jostled me up, you know, say, hey, you gotta, you gotta get going, you gotta get a job, you gotta get to school, you know. So sometimes that, that is a part of it, but also like you have to know that you need that space, you need the time. It's, you're a different person, and the the culture that you've been developing is different. So you can't just go back to normal. You can never go back to how it was. And I think they say this at some point in the film. Like you can't just go back to the way life was. And I think the problem, well, that what the movie shows is the problem that we all have is that 
we the, the civilian world they don't recognize that a lot or most of the time that you can't just have somebody throw them back into the real world and they'll be okay there's a whole litany of things you have to kind of readjust to and and um but like you know not just readjust to the world but readjust to each other like you see it with um al and his, his wife and how they have to kind of even though they have a good marriage and a good family they still have to there's a bit of um hesitance and some uh stuff in eggshells about how to get back together get their intimacy back and then you see of course you know with homer like it, it, with his more obvious uh, injury how it's the, the he, he needs that space but at the same time he also needs their support but of course they don't quite know how to do it properly so it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing that, that this kind of film shows very wonderfully these various levels of support you need and the, and the space you need as well i also think with all that stuff you're talking about with the, the, the way that they uh show the different ways each guy handles all this stuff and just the surroundings i think a lot of uh, one of the interesting things that this movie really does is uh subtly maybe not so subtly but in for 1946 subtly uh it's uh, there's a lot of class stuff going on and how you know frederick march my you know he's 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 got money he's kind of in a better position to handle stuff or not handle stuff whereas homer is kind of just well he's gonna get married and that's his life uh then you got you know i think one of the most telling things is that for the beginning of the movie you think dana andrews is like this hero he's this he's gonna be this cool cool guy almost like if they made it today tom cruise would be playing him or some shit but then when he goes to his his the home he grew up in to see his father and his step his stepmother it's a rinky dink little shack underneath the bridge it's, it's a dump it's like it's, it's so surprising because you see and that's predicated by the scene previously with al in his uh you know high-rise apartment you know that you can see this yeah dana andrews doesn't even couldn't even think that this guy who went to war and you know rose up pretty high in the ranks like oh this guy is actually a banker he's like a white collar guy and he was good at war he, like he it couldn't he, he couldn't even think about that i love that they make dana andrews outrank frederick march i love that dynamic that frederick march not only served but you would your perception if you just see the three characters you got to assume oh he's the oldest so he's the highest ranking but then you have that moment with at the beginning with the taxis when they're getting out and frederick march is like let me pay for it and dana andrews goes no no, no i i got it that's an order the, the dynamics a little more nuanced because um well, you probably, it, maybe other movies or maybe other service movies you met, like, a, a captain is usually maybe like four years in or so, whereas a soldier first class, which was what um, uh, Al is, you know, like he's, they've been in at least what, like 12, 13 years, if that. So, yes, he's a ranks him, but it's also like you can, and even, you know, when they first meet and he tells them he's been married 20 years, he's like, wow, 20 years? Like, he says he's a much more ex worldly, I guess you could say. Even though they both you know, went through hell together, but you know you kind of recognize that it is. It's always it's always kind of portrayed as the uh, the gruff old grumpy sergeant. But you know, and, but you know, and you at first think that, then you, like you said, no, he's a he's a white collar banker. You know, it's, it's that that level of the um, subversion that we talked about earlier. It's so perfect here. And I I think that part of what's great about Fred's arc is you know we we, we int we're introduced to him like I said that that you know I outrank you whatever that he he had some degree of power when he was in the service he had some level of command and unlike fred I'm, I'm sorry unlike frederick march so unlike al who walks out of the army comes back to his white collar life fred uh dan andrew's character is not able to adjust not only to civilian life but not able to adjust to going back to not having anything because there's a great subplot that they give him that he's just outright lying to his wife about their finances because he doesn't want to admit they don't have money and he doesn't want to have to go back to just being a soda jerk. He thinks there should be more because he used to do more. But when he goes to the job interview and they go, well, what are your skills? Do you have any education? He goes, well, I dropped bombs. What what job can I get with that? And they're kind of like, well, you're going back to being a soda jerk. Yeah, this is so what Tom was talking earlier about the, uh, that this undercurrent of this class or economic strife is so palpable in, throughout the whole film. You know, and you hear you hear it mostly. You, well, you, you see it through Fred's struggle, and you also hear it through um, Al's boss, the banker. I guess the uh, I guess the uh, CEO of the bank, whatever. You hear it where he's when you first see the, when they introduced. He's talking about um, uh, what did he say? He says uh, 
you know, we're going to have some hard times. You know, we had we had a big boom after the war, but now we're going to be it's going to recede. Now we're going to be a recession. Um, you know, it, it's it was just funny to me how those these kind of this the history never changes. I guess you know this worry of the recession you know, after this you know long terrible ordeal. Um, and so you see, you see, you hear several characters kind of say out loud that they're moderately worried about the economy, and, and you see the effects of it, the, the tangible effects on the characters. I want to I want to address one thing, um, which is that you know I had seen this film before. Watching it this time, truly, uh, Alec, one of your pieces that you had written actually affected kind of how I viewed this film a bit because there is a scene, and, and there's a scene at one point where uh, Dana Andrews first comes out in civilian clothes. And the wife uh, says, well, you're not going to put your uniform on. He's like, well, I'm never wearing that again. And she seems disappointed. And I think the first time I watched it, you know, I just took that scene to kind of be admittedly a, a read of the scene that was kind of just, oh, but she wants to show off the soldier or she wants to show off the uniform. And then you had written a piece uh, earlier this year, if I may, um, about. You were talking about how, you know, your wife saw you off in uniform going off to, to war. And now you see her you see her going off to deal with this um, this covid crisis, which, again, I, I commend uh, you for what you've done and for her for what she's doing. But um, that there was something about in, in that piece, you could feel. This idea of the two of you ha each now having a a a trial that you have to go through. Uh, on your own and and to try and be there for the other person watching it this time i did kind of feel something else when the wife says you're not going to wear your uniform that i don't think it's just about wanting to show him off but this idea of so he comes home he's wearing the uniform he immediately takes it off and he says i'm never wearing it again and there is a sense even if she doesn't articulate it you do get this feeling of that she's feeling like there was this whole part of him that he had somewhere else and now he's come home and he's put it away in a closet and I will never get to know this part of the man that I married. Yeah. it's. Uh, I don't know if I spoke in, spoke of it in my piece per se, but um, just uh, I have dealt with that in depth uh, over the past few years. Part of the, part of the reason why I write is it's a form of therapy, a form of um, processing what, what happened to me. So, but I guess the kind of the catches in doing so, I put, my, I put all my feelings and thoughts and emotions on a page, but I rarely kind of speak to the people closest to me about it. So, you know, we've had, we've gone through, um, you know, a pretty significant uh, uh, time of her trying to like, uh, be opening up to her. And it's, to be truth be told, there's some stuff that I will never tell her, some stuff that I don't tell, don't tell anyone. Um, at the same time, some things are easier to tell strangers than it is to people I know. Um, so it's it's a weird. You, there's no there's no guideline on how to do it. Just some stuff. You know, I remember a few years ago, I was in a bar in uh, Lower East Side, and I met a Marine, former former Marine. Uh, he was a young guy. He was like twenty six, twenty well, younger than me. And you know, and I I knew he was in the, he was in the shit hard. And he he also he mentioned you know he was um for a brief stint was a contractor. You know, so I from what he told me, what I could tell clean from his presence i could tell he was in some real shit and so i asked him you know i said um so are you thinking about uh and he, and he even said he was uh doing photography and filmmaking and, and i asked him so do you think you ever want to uh use that experience in your films or photography and he said flat out no never again he says i'm never thinking about that ever again and i was like yeah it's it's i would i would think even as a soldier myself that he would, he would be proud and you know maybe some degree he was, but there's a lot of this stuff we just for some people it's not worth digging into again, and you have to. Uh, well, I can't say for sure. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I know for myself though. Yes, some stuff you do need to express and get out, but some stuff it starts this going with you, going with you to the grave, and they kind of get to this a little bit well, when, when you see when you hear about. Uh, uh, for, uh, Fred's uh, his demon, I guess. Is a, he's a, he has a lot of uh, nightmares, night terrors, and he still talks in his sleep. And you find out that he's with well, the recurring nightmare in his head is uh, his crew member dying, you know, being caught in the fire in the in the, in the during the air mission. And so you know, it, it, and his wife his wife asks him about this, but she kind of when she says it, he, she's kind of she says again, she's like, well, just forget about it, leave it behind. And so 
it's a, it's a very interesting. He wants to leave it all behind, and she wants him to do that also, but he can't let it go because it's a part of him. Like like I said, it's it's changed him irrevocably. It's never going to be get out of him. So his his struggle is the struggle he has is how to live with that, live through that, and not have to surrender a piece of yourself while still moving on. It, 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 it's, just, it's a difficult thing to talk about. It's a, different, it's a complex idea. It's like a, it almost sounds like an like oxymoron. How can you let go, but still keep it within you? It, you know, it's, it's, it's a, and all this is so, it's a complicated thing, but it's just expressed in these smaller moments in the movie that it, it does it so well. And I think that's, you know, what makes this movie so special and made it so special so soon after World War II is, I don't think, at least in American cinema, or it's probably at the time world cinema, there was movies that could handle such depth and nuance, uh, especially at a time where, you know, post-traumatic stress wasn't even like a thing people even thought about. And, yeah. you know, any war movies made before this weren't made by guys that went to war. They were made, they were the kind of just rah-rah, yeah, everything's great, we go and fight the bad guys and come home and everything's fine kind of movies. And there's a lack of that uh, emotional realism, if not necessarily, you know, strategic military realism, just that sense of like that. This isn't the case of what it's like to go to war. And I think that's really what Weiler, you know, he brings to this more more so than like, uh, I'm sure the book was was great, but I think as somebody else at the time that wasn't one of the five that went overseas might would probably have not handled this book well at all. Because um, as the documentary says, William Wyler went, you know, before before this, Wyler was like a comedy guy. He was a lighthearted movie dude. And then he 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 found the concentration camps. And um, I, I don't mean to jump in, Tom. I, in that one, you are you are confusing William Wyler with George Stevens. I'm so, OK. So I well, William so Wyler, William Wyler, let me yeah. let me give a little background here just for anybody um, curious, because the thing about Wyler that's more interesting to me is that Weiler, and we're going to talk about all three of these films if this show continues um, for a while, but Weiler, I mean, he'd been directing since the 20s, and he had a number of films. He did Wuthering Heights. He did Dodsworth. But what's interesting is William Weiler unintentionally kind of creates a war trilogy. So William Weiler, prior to the war breaking out in America, William Weiler was working on a film called Mrs. Miniver, which we're going to be talking about um, in, in a year or two, I think, if we continue the show. Uh, Mrs. Miniver is a film that is, it's based on a novel. It's set in England and follows an English housewife as World War II is breaking out and how this affects this English town. And what's interesting is that at the time, you know, Weiler had written this film or, or was directing this film and he'd had a scene where a German soldier lands in Mrs. Miniver's yard. And she basically paints him as she says that he's, uh, you know, uh, one of Goebbels little uh, monsters doing his bidding. And Weiler got a call from uh, I think it's Louis B. Mayer uh, saying, hey, we don't want to we're not in this conflict. We don't want to offend anybody. Let's not say the Germans are evil. And Weiler went basically told him, fuck you. I'm going to say this. I'm going to do this. If I had seven Germans, maybe one could be a good guy. But I got one German. And I'm going to make him a bastard. A month after that argument, Pearl Harbor happens, and Louis B. Mayer calls him up and says, you've got your scene. Do whatever you want. Mrs. Miniver, and Mrs. Miniver ends in a rousing speech. The town, the English town has been bombed out, and it ends in this priest giving a rousing sermon, basically saying, we are all soldiers now, whether we want to be or not. We have been brought into this conflict, and uh, may God uh, protect the, the ones who are right. And interestingly enough, by the time Mrs. Miniver wins Best Picture and Best Director, William Wyler is already overseas making the documentaries for the government. While he's overseas, so now he's made his first film, which is like the pre-war, you know, this is the home front going into war. While he's overseas, he makes a film called The Memphis Bell, where he's following bombers, these B-17 bombers, the same kind of plane that uh, Dana Andrews uh, flies in the film. He makes uh, The Memphis Bell, which is depicting these uh, you know, these these uh, attacks on the plane and had actually gotten some pushback from the government about the film because uh, he includes some of the soldiers saying, get that son of a bitch and shows the planes in evasive action. And there was worry from the government that the audience would look at this, you know, the evasive action 
and think it looked cowardly. And Weiler again kind of pushed back and was like, fuck you. This is what it is. And I want to show what it is. So he makes this film that is in the middle of the war. And then when he comes back, he makes Best Years of Our Lives, which is his, you know, his kind of the, the closing of this unintentional trilogy where you're watching Mrs. Miniver and you are all rah, 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 let's go to war. You watch Memphis Bell and you see how it really is and you see that it's not glamorous and you see that it's, you know, a lot more uh, kind of precise and mechanical than you thought. And then he finishes it up with Best Years of Our Lives that basically goes, the war happened. What do we do now? How do we move past this? Um, I do want to I do want to offer one more correction, if I may, and I hate to jump it too much, but um, there is actually an instance of a movie being uh, kind of critical of uh, the, the veteran experience and the, and the war experience uh, prior to this that does actually have great success, which is, and we'll be talking about this later. Uh, interestingly, in 1929, uh, or 1930, I should say, we get All Quiet on the Western Front, which is based on the 1929 novel. And that movie is another just truly, it is about, you know, this, this young German who's sent off to war. And, you know, because it, that one's more about a culture that is encouraging going off to war, a culture that is all about rah-rah patriotism. And then he goes to war and discovers the horrors of war. There are movies that have dealt with, even Best Picture winners, that, you know, whether it's Wings or All Quiet on the Western Front or even uh, in its own way, Gone with the Wind, movies that are about, quote, the horrors of war and the horror of war. And what I think is great about Best Years of Our Lives is that it is not a movie that kind of looks at war and shakes its finger at war and goes the horrors of war, but instead is specifically and exclusively about what it is like to come back from war, you know? I wasn't necessarily saying there weren't movies like that. What I was saying was that we didn't have guys that went to war and have a specific sense and a specific point of view that they would let to, to add to enhance the reality of what they're seeing. You know, it, all Quiet on the West Front would have been a lot different if Weiler or, or John Houston or George Stevens made it, you know, not to say that there weren't movies that did it. I'm just saying this was kind of the first time that like guys who went, who went into the shit, really kind of had a say in like the stories that were being told you know fucking sam peckinpah was a world war ii veteran his entire career was about trying to show the world how violence is horrible and how it broke him as a man oliver stone went to vietnam and he wanted to show what it was really like and that movie may be a lot more cynical it was dealing with a different war but there there is a sense of reality in war movies after World War II, because now you can get the point of views of guys that actually went to it, who dealt with it, and didn't just say, ah, fuck it, it's a movie, who cares? Yeah, that's actually one thing. Um, it's able to, so the Bishes of Lazar is able to get this really complex and powerful thoughts across, like you mentioned before, without any explicit violence. There's no, like, you know, part of what makes, you know, previous movies, like uh, uh, the ones you from about, about World War One, is they do kind of show or at least allude to, you know, pre-graphic stuff. But here, there's no, like I said, there's, there's no blood and guts, no viscera, but you, just from their emotion, how they express it, you can see how powerful it is. Um, and especially, you, about a point you mentioned just now about the uh, being accused of uh, communism, that's, that's funny because there's a, scene, there's a scene in the movie where Homer is, uh, he's, in a, he's in a shop with Fred, and just some, uh, I'm not sure, I guess he's a kind of a provocateur, I guess, kind of saying kind of bad mouth in the war and kind of also veterans as well. You know, he's saying that, um, he's talking, he's talking to Homer, right? just some stranger. And he said, you know, we all, you all die for nothing. Or we all fought for nothing, you know? And so, you know, and, and again, that's like a, I, I'm a little, um, I don't have much background in the post-war history, or, you know, like, uh, political wise, but, you know, there's a, that was definitely a part of, you know, America that are a part of society that there were vocal people about who, protested or uh, who knew that on, on some level or at least believe on some level that the, you know the war war is wrong in general or in that the, or the at least they recognize the political part of it more so than the actual you know greatest mission or whatever they all saw that there was you know this is still the same the same powers that be are still kind of controlling everything so they put the character in there to kind of you know show that part of society as well well, I'll give you a little fact about that, because I think this is interesting. Um, that's another thing that I don't believe was in the book, because William Wyler 
based that incident on a real thing that happened to him. So he came back and he happened to be uh, leaving. He was going to the premiere of, I believe it was the Memphis Bell. Uh, which they which they it was weird that, you know, if you watch five came back, they talk about which filmmakers made for the government and they only showed troops, which films they made and they showed the public and which ones they buried. But William Wyler was going to the premiere of, I believe, the Memphis Bell, and he was leaving his hotel and he uh, the Statler Hotel, I believe. And he was he heard the doorman make uh, comments about an anti-Semitic comment saying something about those goddamn Jews or whatever. And Weiler walks over and clocks him in the face, gets, uh, you know, is arrested for it. And the government basically comes to him and says, uh, you know, we're going to, you've got a choice. You're either going to get an official reprimand on the record or you're going to be court-martialed. And Weiler turns around and goes, basically argues, why? He goes, people saying anti-Semitic things are why we went to war. Like, this is why we're out there. You know, if I'm fighting these people, I should write it fight him here he ended up receiving the the reprimand but you're also right there were a lot of people who were opposed to the the war here at home um i mean uh an excellent documentary short that came out i believe last year called the night at the garden shows the america first nazi rally at madison square garden there was early on in in the time of the war there was a pro-nazi rally that filled madison square garden and let's not forget one of the chief proponents of the America First movement, which was actually what it was called then, noted exceptional pilot and all around scumbag Charles Lindbergh. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, also, you know who else was there? Fred Trump. Yep. 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 yep, yep. I was also going to say, I didn't want to cut you off. I didn't know uh, Nick Cannon was a doorman back in uh, 1980. <laughs> oh, you saw the, the one black guy in the beginning of the movie? Sorry. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Part of watching these older older films, I kind of I was I wasn't looking for it necessarily, but like just kind of seeing where's the black guy be this one, you know? And then this, you know, there's one black guy. He's uh, he's well, actually, you know, what? it's kind of an interesting point. One black guy in the beginning in, when Fred first comes home in the in the I think the airport, yeah, in the airport, and uh, you know, is one guy. He's a you know, he's a he's a chauffeur or butler or whatever carrying his luggage, but then yeah, that's right. So that he's in the um, main civilian terminal, and this is where he says. Lady says we had no place for you know next couple of days whatever. Then she, then she tells me to go to the uh, the ATC the uh, army or the air force uh, terminal where they get like space a, space available flights. And you see there in, in the background uh, you see all the soldiers playing cards smoking, and there's a you know a black soldier there's a white soldier just they're just, they're just chilling smoking cigarettes and playing cards. And I wasn't really looking for this per se, but like I was I was just kind of fascinated how the representation in cinema itself kind of evolves with the years. So you can see it there. It's small little, small little background things. That kind of speak to the time, also we know where we're going. I will. I will say on that note, if you're looking for something like that, because obviously a bunch of directors went over uh, during the war, and we, we've been talking about them. You know, George Stevens, uh, William Wyler, John Huston. Uh, one of them is Frank Capra, and Frank Capra. And we'll get into this because these other films are also in the registry, and we'll get into those in future seasons. But Frank Capra was over there, and he was making his Why We Fight series, which was, you know, his first film he made was an argument for why we should go to war actually using footage from German and Japanese propaganda films. And he was all rah-rah and about it. And while he was working on his uh, Why We Fight series, he realized that there were special difficulties and specific difficulties for uh, black Americans who were in the army. And he decided to make a film for, you know, he said to make a film specifically about those struggles called The Negro Soldier. And he had an entire list of things, you know, he, he went through, because he, he witnessed the extra adversity and prejudice that these soldiers were facing, but that also at the same time, you know, even though we were in a heavily segregated country, uh, the Hollywood canteen, which was one of the uh, hangouts that Hollywood created for soldiers where they could meet Hollywood stars and have drinks and dance. So that ended up itself getting inducted into the national film registry that got inducted in 2011. So we won't be up to that one for a good long time, but it is interesting that the film is so engaging that it was originally created just to be shown to uh black soldiers who were coming into the army to kind of go hey this is what it's going to be like but it had such an impact that they decided to actually release it to the public too uh, so that they can see what this experience was like um so you talking about the the level of representation in best years of life specifically it is to me very interesting that 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 capra made that film and, and went out of his way to make that film and kind of go look this is not quite as as easy as you think it is, uh, you know, it is not quite so so on the level. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be getting to that at some point down the line. Well, yeah, I'll say, uh, so I don't know how much time I left, but uh, there's one thing I had in my notes here is that um, 
uh, as far as to the question, the overall question of uh, why uh, we think this film being in the, in the registry uh, is so important. I noticed how all the experiences, even now, felt so true, so true to life. I mean, I mean, of course, like we said, it's based on real experiences, but like how to this day, this stuff still happens. These little, these little things that you come home to and you feel, you know, I'm, and then this is probably, you know, where I got emotional at times where I experienced things just like that. Um, one example, um, early in the film, when Fred comes back to his, the store he used to work in, the, the pharmacy, and you see all the, uh, it's a crowded place, and there's, the shelves are stacked, and it's crowded, and you see all the signs of the prices, the price tags on the, on the ceiling hanging down, and he looks overwhelmed, you know, like he's, and you know, famously, we see someone like this in that, uh, in the Her Locker from a few years ago, where at near the end of the movie, you see the, the main character come back to, after, after all the blah, 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 explosions and stuff we've seen, the most powerful moment in the entire movie, it's not a bomb explosion or a EOD thing. It's a him with a single shopping cart, just lost in his own mind, in a in a small aisle of a, a small grocery store. Like he's lost. He doesn't know what to do with himself in this little shopping, you know, shopping. And you know that's you know I say that. Oh, well, it's kind of a side joke that most service members hate that movie because it's, like, it's, it's such bullshit. <laughs> but that was the one true life scene in that film, and then you know to see it, you see it to see that. In this film, so from so so long ago, it's you know this timeless feeling of being lost in your own home. Uh, and then there's a few other things where it's like a, you know, doing the, the whole the job hunt and the uh, trying to apply your military credentials to an actual to the workforce. It's a, a daunting task to say the least. Uh, uh, you know, I was an intelligence analyst. I. You know, I handled classified information. You know, I did all these things, but other, if, other than like joining the police or going back to the Pentagon or to DC, I can't really apply that anywhere. Honestly, it's quite a part of why I chose to do my studies in communications. Um, you know, it's, it was a very difficult thing to kind of come to terms with that you can't apply. You know, and, you know, infantry people have this, or combat arms people have this. In particularly, you know, they can't. Well, I mean, let's become a cop, but I, <laughs> they have such a hard time. Going back to the civilian world and um, applying, you know, and we we have this, we develop leadership, we develop uh, people skills, communication skills, we develop these useful things, but to apply that uh, tangibly is so difficult. Um, one of the near the end, you find out that not just you know we, we you speak of Fred talks about the man he lost, uh, his crew member. But then near the, near the end, you see his parents reading his old, old citations, and he gets he has he, he's earned a uh, distinguished service cross. You know, it's a high honor for that action. And his parents and he, he and he says Fred says he was supposed to throw it away. He doesn't need it anymore. So when he gives it to his parents, they read it and they, and, they, and it's this blowing citation of this absolutely heroic actions. You know, under duress and blood loss, he uh, completed his bombing mission. You know, it's an incredible thing. You know, I have a. When that happened in the movie, I paused it, and uh, I went back. I have a little uh, shelf where I have all my awards and my documents, and I got my uh, I got a bronze star in Afghanistan. So I, I but I haven't really looked at it in a long time. So I kind of opened it up and read through the actual citation. You know, and it's it's uh, actually, you know it, it you know Staff Sergeant Gillis distinguished himself by exceptionally meritorious wartime service. At the Joint Operations Center Battle NCO. His attention to detail, knowledge of the battlefield, and ability to visualize the enemy situation, and ability to conduct meticulous historical research and analysis over 10 years of Operation Enduring Freedom was critical to the mission. Like, this, this, this is a prestigious award that most people in my rank wouldn't get. You know, it's pretty easy given to like officers or whatever. But I can't do anything with this. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it's such a weird feeling that you know I, I you know I have it on my resume because that that's how you know going through like a resume clinics workshops I tell you you know put some more words you know put some of your military service but you know like that's I I earned that when I was in Afghanistan during the uh, the first ever Afghanistan Democratic National Elections for the president. So, you know, I was a part of that. I was a part of history. Twice, you know, because they had a recount, remember? 
Oh, for a while, I don't know you do remember that, but they had a recount, and it was all this violence in New York. So I'm a part of this history, but it, you know, it's almost like to everyone else, does it mean anything? That's a heavy, that's a heavy thing to deal with to to bring come back with all this um, experience and, and all this uh, weight to yourself, but not having anywhere to put it. So you know that comes through so beautifully in, in the movie. And then just the other things like I mentioned earlier about how in, in, in Homer's case, where he's not alone, but he's he has he secludes himself because he's so depressed. And uh, you know, there's a scene where uh, he's holding, he's shooting a firearm, and uh, he's cleaning it. And at one point, you know, he kind of looks on the barrel, and his girlfriend, or should be wife, jokes that, "Well, is that loaded? that's not loaded, is it?" Like you know, there's that specter, that stigma, that that demon, that that ghost. Uh, is he gonna kill himself? Eventually? And you know, no, he's not. He's not. At that level, he's just, he's a stable person, but it, that depression is the depression. The uh, the loneliness is so powerful that sometimes that's worse than you know. And or it's even having so much support, you feel like you can't get anywhere because for whatever reason you're stuck in your own mind. You're stuck by yourself. And so you know. And then uh, we talk about AC um owls descent into alcoholism. That was a big thing for me. Uh, well, I was always a heavy drinker, or rather, I, I have high tolerance, as you guys have seen before. <laughs> and so, but you know, coming back working with you guys at the draft house, you know, you know, it's in the lane, it's a draft house, beer, beer plenty. So uh, I think that looking back now, I probably more than once went overboard, you know, because I was not properly dealing with my my own issues and demons, you know, just kind of reveling and being being alive and being with people. That I didn't really kind of properly gauge myself, and you know, uh, and my consumption, and you know, so all these, all these little things and some big things that are still as true as they ever were, you know. And this movie from you know sixty years ago, sixty plus years ago, it, it's it's so uncanny. It's 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 you know, it's it's haunting, but it's also it's also it's good. It feels empowering. It feels like uh, it feels that I'm glad to be part of this history, part of this message to the people know that. A few years, I think it was a few years ago. Um, we had a family friend. He was a he was a uh, Air Force veteran, but he was in Vietnam, and he he himself had seen some heavy stuff. When he got out, he became a you know a tax boy, he had a very you know very nine to five simple job. And I met him uh, a few years ago. You know, he did our taxes for us, me and my wife. And uh, he, he we talked about my experience. You know, coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. And he asked me, and he he said, uh, "So do you still do you feel the same?" And I told him straight out, you know, I don't think I'll ever be the same again. And he says, that's okay, neither do I. You know, and this is, you know, 30 plus years after his experience, you know, after having lived a full life, you know, with a family and kids and, you know, back at home, he still never feel the same. So I think part of this was so important about this film is that it's a, it's a timeline, it's a, not just a time capsule, but it's a ongoing part of our legacy that these things will happen to us still and it's okay for them to happen to us as always you know we're not alone in, in these struggles you know they, somebody's it's happened to this way before it's going to happen to them again but we, we can build off that knowing that and to help each other further it's just great now alec do you still have a minute because i want to i want to do one more thing and, and segue into something if you've still got time is that all right yeah yeah Okay, so one thing I want to address, and I, I'm going somewhere with this, but um, this was a this was a big hit in its day, which is remarkable for a three hour movie about uh, the struggle of soldiers. But it um, it is the first film to win Best Picture at the Academy Awards, the BAFTA, and the Golden Globes. It won wow. big at the Oscars. Um, it won Best Picture, won Best Director. Uh, Frederick March won Best Actor for his role as Al. Um, it won Best Screenplay, Best Score, and Best Film Editing. And my favorite little fact: Harold Russell. Uh, we were talking about this before the show. Harold Russell was nominated for Best Supporting Actor, but the Academy figured he wouldn't win because he was a non-professional actor. So they gave him a special award for his performance. And then later that night, he won Best Supporting Actor. So he's the only person in history to win two Oscars for the same role. And part of what makes this film so successful and why it is such a landmark uh, to touch on realism, to give the film uh, a very real documentary feel uh, and realism, Weiler made sure that every member of the crew from the Pops Department to the, the sound mixers, to even the grips, all came from the ranks of World War II veterans. And I bring that up because one of the things that you have been involved in in the past and you brought to my attention 
is uh, an organization that helps uh, veterans make films and make short films and kind of process oh, yes, yes. their experiences through cinema. And I was hoping that, especially because that's how Weiler made his crew, I was hoping if you could, you could talk a few minutes about that uh, that organization and, the, and, and what they do. Yes. So um, a few years ago when I was, I went to, I actually live in the Bronx, so I went to the Bronx you know, VA hospital here. And one of the um, projects they had uh, organizations with, uh, it's called the Patton Veteran Project. So basically, it's the uh, grandson of the famous General George George Patton. He's a uh, kind of an entrepreneur and um, uh, kind of a filmmaker or film producer of sorts. And so his whole project is uh, he has a crew of uh, filmmakers in various respects, both you know, and just uh, directors, uh, writers, uh, cinematographers, uh, some 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 mixers, grips, all, all that. Um, he goes from base to base or from VA to VA, and teaches uh, this veterans there, um, filmmaking fundamentals, you know, very kind of a rudimentary kind of a, a quick class, but this, the, the process of doing a, of doing the basics about how film works from the uh, pitching an idea to get it written down to getting the uh, logistics, the props and everything, shooting locations, you know, and part of it, part of it is that uh, the process is very similar to a military operation, the way you have to we have what was the uh, the mission development process in the army? What uh, the way you have to go from concept to execution? It's all very similar to how it was made, and also of course the whole fact is a collaborative effort. You know, it's all a team effort. So you, so you kind of get those gears going again. Your older, your old soldier mentality into this um, art project, and so um, yeah, so so it's both the uh, it's basically the patent veteran project. But also, they kind of sort of category subdivided into the uh, what they call "I Was There" films. And these are the actual film collections that are on YouTube, where they uh, you, you can see the uh, the short films the veterans have made uh, with the help of the uh, patent veterans uh, associates. And you see that it's from all over all over the country. Uh, people all bases from all over, and all, like I said, uh, the hospitals from all over. And I did that. I did that in uh, 2017, I think it was. And now again, that was a big help. And it's and part of it was it was also a great experience because when I was there, I my short film that I did was uh, with two other veterans. One was a uh, old uh, old submarine guy, so you know he was he was kind of off his rocker. But you know it was <laughs> you know submarine guys are a whole different breed, of course. Um, but but it was him, and then I had a um, another older um, she was a female um, army reservist who had got injured and was uh, uh, disabled, so she had to use a walker. And so we kind of took our stories together about our our experiences being back at home and how the how the, the world actually yeah not unlike this movie actually our, our story was uh, it was called uh, authority's perspective and like in his in his little uh, segment he was his short film was about how when he goes to a hospital that's not the VA or any kind of medical treatment they kind of like he's just, he's just a number and just kind of ignore him but then when he puts all his uh, military ID or his uh, veteran status all of a sudden he's a rock star. Then you see uh, with the uh, with the uh, older woman, um, she has trouble getting out uh, of the housing. So you see her uh, in her segment; she's in a long line with the uh, housing authority, and again they're ignoring her. They're, they're just casting her aside. She's just a number. But then she pulls out her her military ID or to her uh, her credentials, and oh, she cuts the line. And then in mine, uh, I was um, in my segment. I get pulled over by a cop. <laughs> this is this is twenty seventeen. Something like that. I get pulled over by a cop, and he uh, kind of um, has his has gun on on his hip, to, you know, trying to you know scope me out. But then when I show him my, I show him a military ID, and I see and he sees the uh, my veteran's license plate. And when I when he comes back around, I'm in my uniform, so he, he sees me hold as a holder for light. So yeah, so we, we get to, we get to express these things through these films. As a, you know, it's a very powerful form of therapy, therapy even though it's just a very simple thing. You know, we I guess the uh, principal photography, quote unquote, is like five hours long <laughs> the, the, the day of. But you know, we get so much done in, in those five hours, and it's um, it's, it's a wonderful program. See, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, remember her. I don't, I mean, me. Yeah, so it's a patent veteran project, and you can also look on YouTube. It's uh, I was there films. I will, I will make sure. Uh, Kyle, let's make sure for this one we'll put that in the in the show notes uh, for everybody uh, once we you know when this when this goes up. Yeah, so yeah, it's a wonderful program. I'm really happy that I did that, and I would definitely recommend. And not, not even, you don't have to be a veteran yourself to do it, but I, well, I would say that 
it encourages you to, if you are nearby a local VA hospital or uh, you have family, that you take part in it as well, you know, because, you know, some of these things, like I mentioned before, some of these things people will never tell anyone else, but through the film, they were able to express it and maybe they might not ever be able to speak it out loud again, but the film can show it what, what the words can. Uh, Tom, do you have anything you want to add before we uh, we, we start uh, wrapping up and letting Alec go about his uh, his day? I mean, I know these are like important movies, but this movie, you know, watching this was just an absolute treat. It, it, without question, you know, this is a movie that absolutely deserves its status in, you know, the film registry. It deserves its status in any registry that honors film. I could see why, you know, like almost immediately you see why, because it doesn't even feel like, even if I'm not a veteran, you know, I watch a lot of movies. It doesn't feel like there's many movies about the armed service or about members of the armed service after the war that feel as lived in and real as this, feel as attuned to the psychology of soldiers coming home to war and are just as confident as this movie is at just being quiet and not letting itself get caught up in the melodrama of, well, it's a movie, we gotta be crazy. These are soldiers, right? There's gotta be somebody, one of them has to die to make the others feel happy that they're still alive or some bullshit. Um, <laughs> I think my letterbox, it, it's, if it's not my top 10, it's like 11 or 12 of movies I've seen for the first time this year. I think it's kind of a, a knockout, you know? And everything Alex said, you know, makes it even more obvious that this is a movie that's like, you know, just really knows what it's doing. This episode was very illuminating, and um, I'm not a veteran, but um, I have, uh, you know, I've, I've I, maybe not on a podcast before, but I've said to friends and everybody, I, 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 my grandfather fought in World War II, and just the history of the military and that sort of, you know, that entire world and all of that has always affected me deeply, and these stories always affect me deeply. And just know, just hearing you tell your stories and how, you know, just how it relates to this and just in general since I've met you. You know, a real treat to bring that sort of, uh, that sort of, uh, you know, that intelligence into something like this instead of just getting, you know, some guy who, you know, does video chats with Jeff Wells. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Alec, I want to, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us, uh, for this, uh, really. I mean, I think this is, this has been great and it's been i mean i know it's been emotional for you and honestly just talking with you i think it's been emotional for us too and uh i i really sheds a light on this this film um i this is one of the first episodes we're recording uh but i will let you know that uh we have some other things lined up and and you have set a very high bar do you have anything that you want to to plug uh on your way out for folks uh you know for yourself or for anything i guess first i'll just give like a, i guess a closing statement i guess just to kind of sum it up again that uh Yes, I think that you know, um, this film is best use of our, best use of our lives. It's not just it's ahead of its time. It's also timeless. You know, like I said, it, all this stuff is so current and so you know lived in and so so very real that you know it's definitely like you know you, you mentioned uh, someone of life. This this should be in the social consciousness one of the big you know the, in the the canon as it were you know of important films or you know and great films that people should should know about more about and see. And like I said, um, I'm glad to hear you guys appreciate this conversation because, like, uh, watching these films doesn't just help me process it, but it helps, you know, people, people talk about the um, civilian military divide. You know, it's a basic real thing. It's a big thing. So doing, watching these films help us, you know, bridge that gap and that understanding, you know, and it's, you know, it's helpful. It's great. It's all good. But yeah, so, um, yeah, so thanks for having me. And then I'll just say um, you can catch my articles on uh, lootandbust.net. Um, my two main things, I do a, um, two annual things. I do, um, during Memorial Day, Memorial Day Week, uh, Fleet Week, I have a series of films, where, uh, essays I cover about uh, films that deal with naval battles or nautical uh, warfare. Um, and then also my big thing, my big staple is that uh, every Veterans Day, I do a uh, war film retrospective where I talk about the current modern films that come out each year and uh, I know how, how they help me get through it and also how they... And I analyze how they, what they mean, about, what they mean, or what they say about the world as it, as it is now. So yeah, I guess I just take that on bus.net, and uh, you see me on my, my Twitter. It's uh, vice at vice with this. You know, I'm I'm uh, talking shit all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for 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 joining us. This has been great. Thank you, dude. Thank you. 
really, really nice to hear from Alec again. Um, yeah. You know, I hadn't heard a, actually a lot of those stories, so um, it was really insightful to actually um, finally get to hear about his, his experience. Yeah. And this was your first time watching this too, right, Kyle? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I I enjoyed it. Of the uh, of the two that we've watched between Sunset Boulevard and uh, you know Best Years of Our Lives, this is definitely uh, my favorite. The the scene where Fred is in his civilian uh, clothes for the first time. You know, it's that moment of just like, well, you know, this is all great. You know, I've never seen this before, but can you put on the can you put on the suit tonight? And my heart just sank because in that moment you just feel that you like you know that that relationship is like built solely on like an like an aesthetic like a certain look and that like she sees him as like like i don't know a prize or a trophy and everything and it it just sort of rubbed me the wrong way well i you know what's interesting you said uh and tom feel free to weigh in on this but you said um you know you don't see melodrama like this anymore you know what you might want to check out which is very has a similar vibe is uh is the Five Bloods, the new Spike Lee film. It's up on Netflix. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely Spike. Definitely saw this movie when he was uh, putting that package together. Yeah, it's it's absolutely it's very similar uh, in terms of you know it's obviously it's for Vietnam veterans uh, and they're actually returning to Vietnam, but it's it's definitely a similar vibe. I think you'll. I think you dig that. It's worth checking out. Well, it's funny too, just because we mentioned it in the show about how the Vietnam era film brat movies were had a bigger sense of nihilism and said, you know, they were just all like, everything sucks, blah, blah, blah. And um, it feels like Spike was trying to capture a lot of what those movies were doing, but like bring that best years of our lives element to that, to the five bloods. So there's a little more dynamism and humanism to it. And um, it's just as heartfelt and uh, packed to the brim with themes as, as is usual with Spike. It feels more like a, shotgun blast and whatever gets hit gets hit and if you don't well at least he fired the shot but um it's still yeah i mean the the five bloods uh, one of the best around so guys as always what movies would you want to add to the film registry um given our criteria mike if you want to explain our criteria sure so what we're gonna do guys uh if you haven't listened before is that we are picking a film that is not in the registry current uh, that is eligible to be in that we think should be uh, based on, you know, on what we watched today, kind of drawing from that and and uh, letting that guide us to a film that we we think is similar in, in theme or cast or style or something. We're going to talk about a film that we think deserves to be in the registry. Uh, Tom, do you want to go first or should I go first? Uh, let's let you go first. Okay. So here's my thoughts on uh, Best Years of Our Lives. Now, Best Years of Our Lives, uh, of course, is the story of three different people and their journey to find happiness and resolution. Uh, And that got me thinking of a similar film, similar dynamic of three different people, interconnected people uh, struggling to get by. And that is uh, Hannah and her sisters. It's, it's, It's a similar dynamic in a way. I mean, obviously they are sisters, but it is watching three people in three very different places in their life, three very different uh, class systems just try and find resolution and, and find happiness, uh, and particularly uh, fraught marriages and conflicts. Um, you know, I'm not going to say there's a direct one to one in terms of uh, who is who or anything like that, but you do see people struggling with their past and people judging them for who they were. And I think that it's a a great story. Uh, and one of one of the finest uh, films that Woody Allen did, one of the best Diane Weiss performances. Does she have hooks? No, but she does have a cocaine addiction, which is fucking wild. Can we just take a moment and acknowledge that only Woody Allen would be the person to go, who should play the fucked up cocaine addict who just can't get her life together? I, I know that woman who plays the mom and everything else. Right on. Interesting. Uh, interesting take. Uh, kind of. I dig that. I am going to go with. Uh, a movie called Rolling Thunder. Uh, This is a movie directed by John Flynn, written by Paul Schrader, starring uh, William Devane and Tommy Lee Jones. And it is about a William Devane plays a Vietnam veteran who was in a PO prisoner of war camp for years. And he comes back home to a rousing uh, parade by the town and all of this. But then he sees his wife has moved on and she's with another man because they all assumed he was dead. His son kind of doesn't even really know how to deal with him. Like, wait, so now you're telling me you're my dad. 
And a lot of it is just uh, this, for as much as it's a B-movie exploitation film you'd see at a drive-in or on 42nd Street in New York City at the time, it's very respectful and well-informed uh, take on PTSD and this detachment that soldiers can feel coming back after a war, especially a war like Vietnam, and especially in the experiences that this character had of just he can't feel like a human. He doesn't feel like a human being anymore. He feels empty and detached, and the only time he feels uh, like he comes to life is... Um, when about halfway through the movie uh people break into his house try to rob him and they kill his wife and uh he decides that i'm gonna become a vigilante violence is all i know and uh ironically enough i just realized this now they put his hand in a garbage disposal and he spends the rest of the movie with a hook wait you, you hang on you you that's not the connective tissue you thought of originally no uh wow okay mainly no okay. i'm honestly was thinking about the 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 i was thinking about the idea of the of a movie taking such care of telling the story of ptsd and soldiers coming home but putting it into an x uh, b movie sense without ever losing that sort of respect and that graceful storytelling um then there's this great scene where he he decides he's gonna raid this these bad guys bar and he needs a backup so he goes to his old buddy who was on the plane with him at the beginning of the movie, but we haven't seen since Tommy Lee Jones, who is living with his family. He's just a layabout. He's kind of just got no interest in anything. And he's kind of a dead eyed zombie at this point. But then William Devane tells him what he's going to do. He, the lights come back and he's ready to spring into action. And, um, it's just all of that. I thought is such a, I feel like Schrader, you know, absolutely must have seen the best years of our lives and use that to inform his take. Um, because like another movie he wrote that's actually in the registry, uh, Taxi Driver, about a Vietnam vet dealing with his detachment from humanity. Um, in the original draft of this script, uh, William Devane's character was supposed to run into Travis Bickle at a drive-in. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just thought... Um, and I had no idea what you were going to pick doing something in, in line with best years of our lives, but in such a vastly different tone and uh, intent with what it's doing, but still has that grace and respect for the men that come home from war and almost uh, an angry sensibility at how the world just used these guys up and chews them out and leaves them nothing to do, but be ghosts in their own home. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Alec Gillis for joining us. Be sure to check out his work over at lootandbust.net and follow him on social media at Vice Victus. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media as well. You can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at RagingBull1990. While you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone who you think might make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.